Matthew chapter 5. As we're continuing to look at the Sermon on the Mount and, and specifically at the Beatitudes. Tonight we're going to address the final Beatitude. There are eight attitudes, basically, that Jesus speaks of, attitudes of those who are part of the kingdom of God. And as we've been discussing in our study on the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Verse 20 is the key to understanding Jesus' message to the people in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the key. That's the key verse that really gives understanding. When you wrote a thesis... Research paper, high school, college, master's, doctorate, whatever, kind of all flows the same. There was always one sentence that was kind of the main thought that the whole research paper talked about. It found its meaning from that sentence. And that's what this verse does for us. Matthew 5, 20, Jesus sums up what he says, the essence of what he is saying to the people in this sermon when he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. We know that Jesus, through his teaching, when we read the accounts of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, and John, we see that Jesus, his teachings, made a fundamental change without altering God's standards. And what I mean by that is the people, when they heard Jesus teach, y'all remember what they would say? Who is this man that he teaches with authority? There was something different about the way Jesus taught and what he taught, the standard. And when Jesus taught in this new standard, he didn't alter what God had spoken in the Old Testament, but rather he reinstated God's intended standard, and that was true righteousness flows from God. And it starts inward and works its way on the outside. Jesus' teaching dealt with the attitude, it dealt with the intent of the heart, and not simply an external list of rules of do's and don'ts. It has more to do with what's on the inside and then makes its way on the outside than just what we do on the outside. And when we talk about the heart, we understand the only individual that can change the heart is God. I can't change my heart. You can't change your heart. We can change some attitudes. We can tweak some things. But to become a new individual, we only find that new birth that Jesus spoke about to Nicodemus in God and God alone through faith in Christ. And in continuing what Jesus had been speaking about, about the heart, the attitude of the heart, Jesus says this in Matthew Chapter 5, verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness, that's the theme. Righteousness that comes from God through Christ. A true internal righteousness that changes an individual from the inside out. Righteousness, as in verse 6, when you go back and look at verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. They will be filled. Righteousness, as in verse 6, is more than just being good. Kind of like the boy, his mom told him to sit down. Y'all know the story. Y'all finished it in your mind before I ever finished it, right? Right? I may be sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm standing up, (laughs) right? Standing up on the inside. Righteousness, Jesus speaks of here in verse 10, and also from verse 6, is more than just being good. It's more than just being good. In other words, we can do good things, we can do right things, and we can still not be right with God. There are many people in our world today, many people in our society today, many celebrities, and I'm not picking on anybody, but individuals like Ellen DeGeneres, people like uh, Oprah Winfrey, 
And you name individuals that do good things. They do good deeds for individuals. In fact, they have been called by others as humanitarians. And we understand that that whole phrase humanitarians is, is those who have a heart for people, those who desire to do good for people. Oprah Winfrey and even Ellen DeGeneres, they're always giving away something and, and helping people. And we would say they do good things. They do good things for others. But however, their life choice, their lifestyle does not mark a life that has been given And transformed by Christ. So just because they do good things doesn't mean they're in right standing with God. Just because I do good things or you do good things doesn't mean I'm in right standing with God. Righteousness, as Jesus is saying here, indicates a whole orientation of life towards God. Nothing's left out. Everything that I am, everything that you are, everything that anyone is, is given to God. It is presented before the Lord. Righteousness indicates a whole orientation of life toward God and his will through faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what Jesus is speaking of. So going back, look what Jesus said. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness. That word means right standing with God. And the only way we can have right standing with God is Christ. Christ. Christ in us. Faith in Christ. We give our whole lives to Christ. Our whole life is oriented toward Christ. When I wake up in the morning, my thought of everything that I do is about Christ. My decisions. He isn't an afterthought. He's my forethought. My actions, he's not the afterthought, he's the forethought, everything. And these individuals are being persecuted, verse 10 says, because of how they have oriented their life in Christ. The Pharisees said that righteousness consisted of performing certain actions. But Jesus said it's centered in the attitude of the heart. And the same applies to sin. Where does sin erupt from in our lives? It erupts from our hearts. And we know when we speak of heart, when the Bible speaks of heart, most oftentimes it's used metaphorically to speak to the center of our being, the soul. That place that lives on forever, that will never die. The soul never dies. The outward body will die, but the soul will never die. Everyone's going to live for eternity somewhere. The question is, where are we going to live for eternity? With the Lord in heaven or eternally separated from him in hell? Sin issues from the heart. That's why the the Bible tells us watch over, guard your heart because that's where we live. That's where the issues of life flow from. And the Pharisees had a list of external actions that that were sinful, but Jesus explained that sin came from the attitude of the heart. In other words, when he said, don't get angry and sin. Because anger is murder in the heart. I might not do it physically, but I've done killed them in my heart. Lust. Jesus says if you look on an individual, whether it be a man or a woman. What I mean by that, a woman looking on a man, a man looking on a woman. It's sad that I had to explain that, but I'll explain that. If I look on them and I have lust in my heart, Jesus says you've already committed the action. It's like if you've already done something because you did it in your heart again just keying on this concept of righteousness those individuals that are being persecuted the righteousness of the pharisees and the teachers of the law was insufficient for entry into the kingdom and that's why jesus stated what he did in matthew 5 20 unless your righteousness exceeds that of the pharisees that of the religious leaders you will not be a part of the kingdom of god because it was external not internal It was a matter of what they could do, not what God has done. Jesus was describing to the Jewish people, as to us, of his day, the character of those who were a part of the kingdom, God's kingdom. The righteousness he taught, not just something on the outside, it's on the inside. And because Jesus' words illuminated the true character of the religious leaders, These men tirelessly tried to trap Jesus in his own words so that they could discredit him, so that they could accuse him, so that they could arrest him and do away with him. Jesus was persecuted because of his righteousness. 
And Jesus says, those who follow his example through faith in him, they will be persecuted for their righteousness, their right standing with God in Christ. And just as the religious leaders did this to Christ, so do they do it in our time. We know this. We see this. Our society is not a friend of God. And if they're not a friend of God, they will not be a friend of God's children. There is a conflict, as we know, in the world. And the main reason for this is that we are different. And we're different because we don't live according to the world's standards. We once lived according to that standard. Everybody in this room at one time lived according to the standards of the world. Because we were all born into sin. That's what the Word says. But that changed in our hearts and our lives when the Holy Spirit convicted us. And by faith we came to Christ and we confessed our sins and asked him to come and dwell in our lives so that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live by his power for the Father. At that moment, we had right standing with God. And we walk in that. As we read the Beatitudes, we find that these individuals who are a part of the kingdom, they represent an outlook that is radically different from the world. Radically different. And this life that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, in the Beatitudes that we've read from verse 3 through verse 12, it is a life that is conspicuous. In other words, it is plainly seen. It's not hidden. We light a lamp or a candle. You don't hide it under a bushel, right? It's plainly seen. It's conspicuous. It's plainly seen. And so Jesus says that life, Christ in us, it will attract persecution. There's no ifs, there's no buts, there's no maybes, there's the will. It will. At some point, sometime, in some magnitude, it will draw persecution. And we must expect this, not in a doom and gloom attitude, but understanding that God has spoken that because of the way we live our lives, we orient ourselves, but... As we're walking through this, we have to caution ourselves at the same time. We need to make sure that we're suffering for the right reason. That our suffering is not due to our bad decisions or a result of our disobedience. Peter picks up on this with this concept. He says in 1 Peter 2.20, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, that finds favor with God. I want to find favor with God. And something that finds favor with God is that if I am enduring persecution from the world because of the way that I'm living my life, the scripture plainly says if I patiently endure that, I'm not retaliating. I'm not returning evil for the evil that I receive, but I'm giving good. The Bible says... God gives favor. God gives favor. He gives grace. Now what's interesting is I firmly believe, as I've heard others say, that it is no coincidence, it's not by accident, that Jesus passes from verse 9 being a peacemaker to persecution in verses 10, 11, and 12. Because those who uphold God's standards of truth, justice, purity, and who at the same time refuse to compromise with the present evil in, in our society will experience unpopularity, rejection, criticism. Paul understood this. 2 Timothy 3, verses 10, 11, and 12. Paul wrote to Timothy some of the last words that he penned. He says, now you, Timothy, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lustra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all. Now look, he didn't say some. He didn't just say you, Timothy. He says all, and all means what? All. I, I know I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm definitely not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I do know what all means. That means all. And Jesus said here, through his servant, all who desire to live godly righteousness 
in Christ, that's our only means of righteousness, says will be persecuted. Will be. Don't think it's strange, as James says, when these trials come upon you, that some strange thing is happening to you. It happens for a purpose. We live in a hostile world toward our faith, and we shouldn't be surprised when we're persecuted. And it's important for us to understand what it is that we are bearing. What are we bearing in this persecution? What are we bearing? Because if we realize and keep at the forefront of our minds and our hearts why we're bearing this persecution, what, what are we bearing that causes us to be persecuted? What Jesus tells us in verse 11, he said that those who are, have righteousness that he's been teaching, that persecuted for the sake of righteousness, that theirs are the kingdom of heaven, but, but he tells us what we're bearing that causes us to be persecuted. This whole concept of righteousness, but look how he says it in verse 11. Blessed are you. Now notice how he made it personal. He didn't say those. He made it personal, right? You know, if, if you're a teacher, I looked at Carol again, I'm sorry. But if you're a teacher in class and you come in, all right, guys, if y'all don't settle down, that's pretty much, I don't know, Carol, I know you've done that, especially in dealing with, with kids the many years that you have. If y'all don't settle down, that means everybody. It's all inclusive. But you may come in class, and I know you've probably done that too, where you don't say y'all, it's basically you, if you don't sit down, this is going to happen. You single it out. Well, now Jesus says, he said, y'all, that's southern, right? L.A., we can say that. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Kind of like scoop and shovel. If Heath was here, he would, he would kind of chuckle right now. All right, that's the picture. We'll come back. But when we, when we look here, it's personal. Jesus says in verse 11, blessed are you, blessed are you. When people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, why are we bearing this? Jesus says, because of me. Because of me. This is a privilege, guys. Verse 11 is a privilege. Have you ever read it that way? I remember the first day that I read that scripture that way. Verse 11, a privilege. That it dawned on me. What am I bearing? I'm bearing the name of Jesus. You're bearing the name of Jesus. It's a privilege to be persecuted. Is it not? Peter and John, they were beaten. Our, our individuals, disciples were beaten. And what did they? They went away rejoicing that they had the privilege of bearing those stripes and that harsh punishment for Jesus. Now, they, they weren't... Uh, rejoicing in the lashes and the pain, they were rejoicing in the reason of the lashes and the pain. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. Man, doesn't that change everything for you? It changed. When I read that verse that way, it changed everything for me. What am I bearing to receive the persecution? I'm bearing the name of Jesus. 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 The honor, the blessing from this persecution lies in the reality that we bear the name of Jesus. Jesus says, you face these insults. You face these evil things that people are saying about you. It's not you. It's me. It's me. That's what Jesus said. John 15, Jesus told his disciples, John 15, beginning with verse 18. Jesus told his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, before he was betrayed in the garden by Judas, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, that gives meaning to Matthew 5, 11, doesn't it? Because this world, it will hate you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Peter wrote 
his epistle, 1 Peter 4, 14. He says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, spoken bad of, I mean, really spoken bad, that word reviled, that's a strong word, really spoken against, for the name of Christ, Peter says, you're blessed. You're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Why do we get the persecution? Because we bear the name of Jesus. We bear the name of Jesus. And far from being despondent, far from being depressed, being saddened or being enraged, how dare you? As believers, we find ourselves, when we find ourselves in these situations, Jesus gives us a command. And the command comes in verse 12. When we're persecuted because of righteousness, and we're personally persecuted, why? Because we bear the name of Christ, we carry Christ, we exemplify Christ, our life testifies of Christ. Jesus gives us a commandment. When we find ourselves being persecuted for that, what does Jesus say we need to do? What is the attitude? We don't grumble. We don't gripe. We don't complain. We don't retaliate. We don't return evil for the evil we're receiving. No, Jesus says in verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This call of joy which is not an emotion, it's an attitude of the heart. Again, it's not an emotion. Joy has emotions in it, but joy is not an emotion. Joy is an attitude of our heart. It is a resolved attitude of our heart before God in Christ. This joy, this attitude is reinforced with, Jesus says, be glad. Be glad. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And guys, if you were able to be at men's breakfast this month and you heard Pastor Jim speak, it was a great word. It was a short word, but man, it was a great, impactful word. But he, he used this scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It goes along with what Jesus is saying here in verse 12 of Matthew 5. Paul writes this, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What are we giving thanks for? And it's the same thing Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, 12. And what Paul is writing to the Thessalonian believers. Are we giving thanks for the circumstances? No. That's not what, that's not what the Lord is saying here. We don't give thanks for the circumstances. We don't give thanks for these things because there's many things. How could we give thanks for the things? Well, my grandmother that was a second mother to me. Well, both of them, I, I was five when my dad's mom, or four when my dad's mom passed away, but it was still impactful, but I was young. But when my mom's mom passed away, I was, I was 19. It was more impactful. She was a second mother, which grandmothers are supposed to be a second mother to you. And, 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 and when she died, man, it, it tore me up. Or, or, or am I supposed to rejoice in the fact that they, that they passed or, or in, in a hardship that has happened, a loved one was taken away dra tragically? No, I'm not rejoicing in that. Notice, what am I rejoicing in? Or rather, who am I rejoicing in? 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, give thanks in all circumstances. How am I able to give thanks? Because my thanks is not the circumstances. My thanks is Christ. Christ in me. What am I giving thanks for? I'm giving thanks for Christ. And that's what Pastor Jim had pointed out. Guys, if you were there, if you'll remember, he was pointing out, we give thanks for Christ. Therefore, no matter what the circumstances are, I'm able to give thanks. Why? Because I'm giving it for Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying here in verse 12. When I am persecuted because I bear his name and I bear his essence by Holy Spirit living in me, what am I giving a rejoice for? The ill treatment? No, I'm giving a rejoice for Christ in me. Why? Because I'm not looking at the things of this life. I'm realizing what's coming. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Paul writes this, Therefore we do not lose heart, 
But, through, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now notice how he set those two things apart. He talked about the, the, the difficulties we have, which we can throw persecutions in that. He called the difficulties we have in this life, whatever they may be, light. In comparison with what we're going to receive in Christ when he returns. That is what? Weighty. It outweighs. It outweighs. What we will receive outweighs. And that goes along with what Jesus says here. Rejoice, be glad, verse 12. For your reward in heaven is what? Great. It's not little. It's not small. It's great. It's greater than anything. That's what Paul says. For the momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And then listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18. While we look not at these things that are seen, that word not at, look not at, it's one word in the Greek. It it, it doesn't mean to ignore. It simply means I don't keep looking at it. I don't focus on it. It's not my focus. I don't ignore it, but that's not my focus. Who's my focus? Christ is my focus. Heaven, my reward in him, that's my focus. I'm not concentrating on what is seen, but at the things which are not seen, verse 18, for the things which are not are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. That's what Jesus is saying here. Rejoice when we're persecuted because we're bearing the name of Jesus. Rejoice. Rejoice. Why? Because we know what awaits us in heaven. I've alluded to the song before, but it always comes to my mind when I think about this. It will be worth it all. Everything. It will be worth it all. Jesus is telling us, for those who follow him, And those who live according to the principles of God's word, we will face opposition. We will face rejection. Everything that Jesus has talked about, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the poor in heart, or pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. These individuals that exhibit the nature of the kingdom. The nature of their Savior, who find their righteousness not in the things that they do, but in who they serve, that is reflected by what we do. These individuals will face opposition. They will face rejection. The enemy isn't going to ignore us. He's going to do everything he can to tear us down. If we're living for the kingdom, I promise you he's going to turn the heat up just as hot as he possibly can. Because Jesus told us who he is. He is the enemy of our soul that wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy. He doesn't want to just maim. He wants to destroy us. He doesn't just want to hurt us. He wants to destroy us. Those who uphold God's standard, as the kip comes back, his standard of truth, of justice, of purity, those who refuse to walk the ungodly lifestyle of our society, Jesus says, we will be, you will be unpopular by the world's standards. You won't fit in. You won't fit in. He says those individuals will receive criticism. Those individuals will receive opposition from the world. But Jesus says, in spite of that, our attitude is to rejoice and to be thankful. Rejoice, be thankful, and all of it. Because God has reserved a a special blessing for our suffering. Because it's all about Him. It's all about Him. You know, as we close tonight, have you ever wondered why believers in other countries like China or Vietnam, and in fact at one time uh, listening to missionaries that have gone to Vietnam that is a communistic country, You could not be a pastor. 
you could not be a pastor unless you had been thrown in jail. For you to be able to get your credentials as an assembly guy pastor in Vietnam, you had to be thrown in jail because they, they basically said, if you haven't been thrown in jail, you haven't been a good witness. I mean, that was their logic. It makes sense, doesn't it? You're not being a very good witness if you're not being thrown in jail. Because Jesus says if we live this life of righteousness that he gives, it starts on the inside, it works its way on the outside, it's going to stand out. It's like wearing polka dots or stripes, whatever you want to say, that clashes. We clash with the world. We're supposed to clash with the world because we're living to a different standard. But we're not to bemoan. Jesus says rejoice. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, will suffer, will endure persecution. But Jesus says don't faint, don't grow weary, don't grow sour. Rejoice. Rejoice. Because we're not living for this life. We're living for what is to come. And we must stay focused on Him. Father, we come before you tonight, and Lord, we thank you, always thank you for your word, and want to exhibit a heart of gratitude, a heart of gratitude and of thanksgiving to you. Father, Lord, even as we end this portion, Lord, on the Beatitudes and, and how you ended it, those who are persecuted for righteousness, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are spoken ill of, those who are slandered by the world because of you. Lord, we're to rejoice because we realize, Father God, Lord, the end of our life, or I should say the beginning of it, And that is that we will live for you in eternity. And God, things that cannot even be described. Oh Lord, help us. Help us. Help us to be aware of the temptation to compromise our faithfulness to you, to your purposes, in order to avoid shame or loss from the world. Oh God, help us to understand, Lord, what we are bearing that causes persecution, we are bearing the name of Christ. Oh Lord, strengthen our hearts, strengthen our faith, that we're not offended, we don't shrink back, but we rejoice in the face of this persecution because of the hope that we have in you. Come on, can we stand together?